Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. We're continuing today in our series on the nature of God. Today's sermon, we see that while God is a loving, merciful, and forgiving God who has gone to great lengths to save our souls, he is also a just God or a God of justice. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, he is the rock, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Psalm 7, verse 11, God is a just judge. God is angry with the wicked every day. Galatians 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Stalag Love Three POW Camp opened in April 1942 in Sagan, Germany. Prisoners constructed two feet by two feet tunnels supported with wood from 4,000 bed boards, 90 beds, 62 tables, 34 chairs, and 76 benches. To avoid detection by seismograph microphones, each tunnel was dug 30 feet below the surface. Digging was done with powdered milk cans. Air pumps supplied air. Trolley carts moved dirt. Small pouches made from old socks attached inside the prisoners' pants allowed them to discreetly scatter the yellow dirt outside. The first escapee discovered the tunnel came short of the woods. Still, 76 men exited the camp without detection. Chaos ensued. Hitler was infuriated as his military scrambled to recover the escapees. That was a great escape. Our just but merciful God planned a far greater escape for all who would comply with the terms of the gospel. The Spirit tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? This salvation is so great because God gave his only son to be abused and tortured to death on the cross. This salvation is great because the Spirit inspired 40 penmen, 66 books spanning 15 centuries to make known the good news. This salvation is great because it demanded so much of God and comparatively so little of us. The Spirit spoke of the great escape repeatedly. Jesus told the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism in Matthew 3, verse 7, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Jesus told a similar group in Matthew 23, verse 33, Serpents, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? We read further in Hebrews 12, verse 25, For if they did not escape, who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Again, Romans 2, verse 3. And do you think, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? And also, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2 and 3. The day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, and they shall not escape.
So we know we all fall under one of two categories. Those who escape or those who do not. Which will you be? Are you aware that those dearest to you will likely follow you in making or not making the great escape? We need to confront our mortality. No matter how conscientious we are about health and fitness, death and the judgment are inevitable. As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, verse 27. And friends, that is why Jesus came. The next verse reads, So Christ was offered once, to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Sadly, some live in denial. Physicist Stephen Hawking caused quite a stir when he declared, There is no heaven or afterlife. It is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. Shortly before W.C. Fields' death, friend visiting his hospital room was surprised to find the atheist actor reading the Bible. When asked what he was doing, Fields replied in his inimitable cadence, looking for loopholes. Hawking and Fields, like many today, want to make the great escape, but on their own terms. Both men pretended to make the great escape by making the afterlife disappear. Others conjure up their own pet ideas, grace alone, faith alone, annihilation, once saved, always saved, and on it goes. These are not actual escapes. They are escapes from reality. Many years ago, a man conned his way into the orchestra of the emperor of China, although he could not play a note. Whenever the group practiced or performed, he would hold his flute against his lips, pretending to play, but not make it down. He received a modest salary and enjoyed a comfortable living. But then one day, the emperor requested a solo from each musician. The flutist got nervous. No time to learn the instrument. He pretended to be sick, but the royal physician wasn't fooled. On the day of his solo performance, the imposter took poison and killed himself. The explanation of his suicide led to the English phrase, he refused to face the music. No wonder so many atheists, bold and brazen in defiance of God, while in good health, sobered up in the face of death. Dan Erickson says, a fellow skeptic once asked atheist Voltaire if he would speak words of comfort to a dying friend. Voltaire responded, I don't think I can do that. The thought there might really be a hell plagues me continually. Atheist Cesar Borgia, while I lived, I provided for everything but death. Now I must die and I'm unprepared to die. Thomas Hobbes, I say again, if I had the whole world at my disposal, I would give it to live one day. I'm about to take a leap into the dark. Edward Gibbon, all is lost. Finally, irrevocably lost. All is dark and doubtful. Thomas Paine, stay with me for God's sake. I cannot bear to be left alone. Oh Lord, help me. Oh God, what have I done to suffer so much? What will become of me hereafter? Honore Gabriel Racchetti Mirabeau. Give me more laudanum, which is an opium mixture, that I may not think of eternity and what is to come. Sir Thomas Scott, until this moment, I thought there was neither a God nor a hell. Now I know and feel that there are both, and I am doomed to perdition by the just judgment of the Almighty. Voltaire, I am abandoned by God and man. I will give you half of what I am worth if you will give me six months' life, he said to Dr. Fokin, who told him it could not be done. Then he said, 
then I shall die and go to hell. Sir Francis Newport, oh, the insufferable pangs of hell, oh, eternity forever and ever. Robert Ingersoll, oh God, if there be a God, save my soul if I have a soul. Others say, he said instead, oh God, if there be a God, save my soul if I have a soul from hell, if there be a hell. Charles Churchill, what a fool I have been. C.S. Lewis was told about a gravestone inscription that read, Here lies an atheist, all dressed up and nowhere to go. To which Lewis replied, I bet he wishes it were so. Another epitaph reads, Consider, young man, as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be, so prepare, young man, to follow me. Someone else scratched below the epitaph. To follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. Making the great escape is a function of a faith that fears God. It motivated Noah to save his family. Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his household. Why did Jesus preach hellfire and brimstone more than he preached of heaven? Because he knew it would awaken some who could not be stirred by God's love. Proverbs 1 verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Psalm 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Sermons on hell remind us that our God is just, that they remind us that our God is a God of justice. They remind us of how great an escape our salvation is, and they spur us to prepare if we're not ready. Oh yes, Jesus was the Lamb of God. He was meek and lowly. He patiently took abuse while on this earth, but he also taught on hell, and did so in his very first sermon. He warned in Matthew 5, verse 22, Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. The spirit of our age is tolerance. I'm okay. You're okay. But Jesus taught in Matthew 7, 13 that most people are definitely not okay, but on the broad way to destruction. God does not classify men like the world does, separating them into rich or poor, educated or uneducated, white or black, male or female, young or old. Oh, none of that. Instead, God separates men this way, by those who are on the broad way and those who are on the narrow way, those who build on the sand and those who build on the rock, those who serve one of two different masters. Today, our salvation is a great escape because hell never ends. Heaven and hell differ in so many ways, but they're equally permanent. Hell is not temporary. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Paul speaks of the everlasting God in Romans 16, verse 26, and the eternal spirit in Hebrews 9, verse 14. Friends, everlasting punishment lasts as long as life eternal. In fact, the English words everlasting and eternal come from the very same Greek word that means without end. If hell only lasted 100 years, then so does heaven, God, and the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know from Scripture that that is not the case. Some say it's not fair to be punished eternally for a few years in rebellion. Is it fair to be rewarded eternally for a few years of obedient service? Listen, it only takes seconds for a man to stab someone to death. But we do not say it's unjust for the perpetrator to spend 40 years in prison for the wrong that took only one second. The ultimate sin is rejection of Christ. 
doing so results in never-ending punishment. Friends, God is just. Our salvation is a great escape because hell is a place of incomparable darkness. The Bible says in 2 Peter 2 verse 4, God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. In Jude 1 verse 13, the writer says of false teachers, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jesus says of the one talent man, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, Matthew 25 verse 30. We're not talking about a shady spot. We're not talking about dim lighting, but blackness of darkness, outer darkness, and a darkness more extreme than the thick darkness of Exodus 20, verse 21. Why so extremely dark? Hell, you see, is everything heaven is not. In heaven, there is no night because God is the father of lights and Jesus is the light of the world. Once we see the light of day at birth, we're never fully at home in the darkness. We naturally fear the dark. You may be thinking, oh, that's just little kids and timid little ladies. Not so fast. I like it pitch dark at night when I'm in the comfort and security of my own bed, but take me out of my element and it's a little different. I enjoy reading grave markers at old cemeteries but you won't find me there after dark. I'm not superstitious either. Of course, there is absolutely no difference at night other than it's dark, but there's just something about the dark. And hell, we're talking about an incomprehensible darkness in an environment that makes a cemetery seem like Disneyland. All this talk of hell is not merely something preachers invented to scare people straight. No, Jesus exclaimed in Matthew 23, 33, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? You see, Jesus was serious because God is just. Furthermore, our salvation is a great escape because hell is a lake of fire. Oh, people bend over backwards to explain away the horrors of hell insisting that all the talk of hell as a place of fire, well, that's, that's just figurative. But even if that were the case, would that make hell any less terrifying? Think about it. We read about a furnace of fire, Matthew 13, 49, a lake of fire and brimstone, Revelation 20, verse 10, baptism in fire, Matthew 3, verse 12. Trust me, you don't want this baptism. If all these statements or phrases were merely the use of metaphors, they would still represent a terrifying place. Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, verse 47 and 48, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Incidentally, Jesus wasn't teaching self-mutilation. He was using hyperbole to stress the urgent priority of removing sin from our lives. Again, in Revelation 20, verse 15, John writes, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we have fire and fire and fire and fire. All this repetition is no accident. Hard to believe it's been 21 years since 9-11. Remember the pictures of people jumping out of the upper floors of the World Trade Center? I can't imagine jumping from the 80th floor of a high rise. But in their case, the alternative was being roasted alive. Friends, hell is a place where people burn, but never burn up. Marshall Keeble used to say, I'll tell you how hot hell is. You could remove the dam from hell and place them in the hottest fire ever made by man, and they'd freeze to death in 10 seconds. And that's about right. Escaping this forever burning fire makes ours a 
a great salvation. Friends, God is loving, but God is just. Other scriptures teach hell is a place of conscious pain and suffering. Some religious neighbors insist that hell is simply non-existence, annihilation. Friends, that's not punishment. When I was a child, I fought going to sleep. But the older I get, the more I appreciate it. The prospect of an eternal nap would more, be more of an inducement than it would be a deterrent to sin. Listen to Jesus. We're in Luke 12, verse 4. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Friends, that's no nap. There is something worse than being killed by man. Jesus calls it hell. He is again in John 5, verses 28 and verse 29. John 5, verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Six times the word torment is used to describe the state of the wicked after death. You can't torment one who's annihilated. Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil, the beast, and the false prophet will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 14, verse 10 says, Men shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. This word torment indicates agony, not sleep. Make the great escape because of the company there. The most evil men and women to walk the planet will be there. Impenitent rapists, child molesters, mass murderers, men so wicked they'd make the devil blush. Jesus says in Matthew 25, verse 41, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. If anyone's in charge, it'll be Satan. That's reason enough to make the great escape. There's no rest day or night in hell, Revelation 14, 11. There's no help in hell. Worst of all is the reality you didn't have to be there. Have you planned your escape? The Holy Spirit asks, how can you escape if you neglect so great salvation? God is just. Don't suffer the eternal consequences for your sins. There was no price I could pay. Let the Bible speak. We pray that you've heard God speak to you through his word. Our God is just. Contact us for a free copy of this sermon, number 1366. Call to receive the Truth Freeze Bible course. Join our Facebook page for daily scripture posts and comments. Visit letthebiblespeak.com 
to watch videos, hear audio, or read transcripts of the program at your convenience. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye, and may God bless you. We hope you've been challenged and encouraged by Bible teaching. We strive to speak the truth in love and aspire to help you make heaven your home. I have dear friends among congregations in your area committed to worshiping in spirit and in truth, John 4, verse 24. Know that when you visit, you will not be singled out or embarrassed, but will receive a warm welcome from caring Christians. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. We hope by God's providence to be an avenue through which you more fully live out the will of God. My dear friends near you are knowledgeable and approachable Bible teachers. They would gladly meet with you to discuss the scriptures with an open Bible. Life is short, so short. James 4.14 says, Our life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We hope you see the urgency in doing all you can as soon as you can to make sure your life is right with God. Get the Let the Bible Speak app and visit letthebiblespeak.com for a wealth of biblical teaching. Call, text, or email, and we'll personally return each message you send to us.